know people are it's it's middle of the afternoon for us but i know it could be it's midnight in the philippines and later and earlier elsewhere so thanks for joining us yeah thanks all right for we've, late. we've crossed into triple digits and it's now a minute past our start time so let's go ahead and get going um so welcome to the fourth of our six science editing webinars from the Night Science Journalism Fellowship at MIT. Uh, today's topic is editing controversial science. Um, my name is Joshua Hatch and I'm your host today. I'm a former Night Science Journalism Fellow and the editor of the Night Science Journalism Science Editing Handbook, um, which you're gonna hear about more in a moment. Uh, these webinars have been held monthly on a variety of topics. If you've missed our first three, we have them online. You can watch them at ksjhandbook.org. Just look for the menu that says webinars. And that's where you can also sign up for the last two webinars in this series. Um, all of these webinars are an extension of our recently published online science editing handbook, which you can also find at ksjhandbook.org. You're gonna hear that URL a few times today. And I encourage you to, to visit there. You can read the handbook online. You can download it as a PDF. And I'm also really excited to say that we're soon going to have a Spanish translation available on the site, and we're hoping to add more translations next year. Um, both the handbook and the webinar series are made possible and made free to you, uh, thanks to support from the Calvi Foundation and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute's Department of Science Education, and are an outgrowth of a several years long set of Calvi supported in person science editing workshops that we've been leading. We're really pleased, you know, it's, we've made a pivot during the pandemic, um, and, uh, but it's, it's turned into a good thing because now we can bring this to a much larger audience. And I really wanna give a huge thank you to Kavli and HHMI for making that possible. Also, thanks to everybody at the KSJ Fellowship at MIT, which is a fabulous program uh, for hosting these webinars and to SciComm X, which has been instrumental in bringing them to you and producing them. Today's webinar is gonna run about 90 minutes. And in a moment, I'm gonna introduce you to our three terrific panelists, each of whom will speak for about 15 minutes. And then we'll move into a Q and A session, uh, which historically has been really robust in these webinars. And I'm sure today's will as, today's will as well. Um, if you're participating on Zoom, you can use the QA button to send in questions. Uh, we'll ask a few as we go, but the bulk of them we'll try and get to at the end. Uh, if history is any guide, we won't be able to get to all of them, but we'll do our best to get through as many as possible. Um, and you can also use the chat to uh, talk uh, with us and amongst yourselves and have that conversation. So please make ample use of those tools. Um, if you want to live tweet the webinar or ask questions via Twitter, you can do that using the hashtag uh, KSJ Science Editing. Uh, and feel free to let others know that they can also follow along uh, on Twitter or at the link. Um, uh, if you go to ksjhandbook.org and find today's webinar, you'll find it there. Um, as a reminder, today's webinar is being recorded and we'll post it on our ksjhandbook.org site uh, very soon. Uh, in fact, actually, I think it will appear immediately following uh, the conclusion of the webinar. And additionally, if you are on Zoom and, and you attend at least one hour, uh, you'll receive a certificate of attendance um, you'll also receive a survey after the webinar, and these are really important. They're short, but they're important to us, and I appreciate you taking just a couple minutes to let us know what you thought of the, uh, of the webinar. Uh, and finally, if you haven't already, I highly encourage you to sign up for the uh, two remaining webinars this uh, uh, August and September, uh, and they can be found at, wait for it, ksjhandbook.org. All right, enough of me. Now let me introduce our, uh, our speakers. Um, first up, we have uh, Laura Helmuth. Laura is the Editor-in-Chief of Scientific American and a former editor at the Washington Post, National Geographic, Slate, Smithsonian, and Science Magazines. She is the former president of the National Association of Science Writers, and she serves on the boards of Skyline, Spectrum, High Country News, and the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine Standing Committee on Advancing Science Communication. So the fact that she made time for us today is um, incredibly appreciative. She's both a birder and a tweeter, and she wrote our chapter on today's subject for which she is going to provide an overview. Then we're going to hear from Melvin Newsom, a veteran freelance journalist and editor in Charlotte, North Carolina, with more than 20 years experience reporting on news and general interest topics. Over the past year, she has reported extensively on the physiological, emotional, and societal impact of the coronavirus. She received a grant from the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting to conduct an in-depth reporting on COVID-19 in the Black community. 
And in the past decade, her reporting has focused primarily on education and health with a concentration on disparities in rural health. A feature in O, the Oprah Magazine about genetic testing earned the June Roth Award for medical journalism. She has also published in Scientific American, Chemical Engineering News, Prevention, the Heckinger Report, the New York Times. Melba is gonna focus her talk today on false equivalency. In anchoring our stellar relay team is Kendra Pierre-Lewis. She's a climate reporter with Gimlet Spotify podcast, How to Save a Planet. Prior to joining Gimlet, she was a climate reporter with the New York Times and Popular Science. She is also author of the book, Greenwash, Why We Can't Buy Our Way to a Green Planet. Kendra has a master's in science writing from MIT and another in sustainable development with a focus on policy analysis and advocacy from the SAT Graduate Institute. And she's not achieving dramatic feats like living in France without eating butter. And seriously, I don't even know how that's possible. Uh, Kendra can often be found on Twitter railing against mayonnaise. But today her focus will be on how to empower readers to take action. So again, please make ample use of the chat and the QA features. Uh, there's also a live transcript button. Uh, it's computer generated, but it's not bad. Um, and uh, we'll get to as many questions as we can. And now without further ado, Laura, take it away. Hey, thank you so much. Thanks, Josh, for organizing this event. And I echo the thanks that you gave to everyone for supporting it. And thank you to the audience for coming today. It's, um, it's great to, to be here to talk about these you know, exciting and interesting subjects. And um, so we're going to have short presentations to leave plenty of time so that we can have a, you know, a lively discussion afterwards. So you know, feel free to ask us anything. Uh, and it's great to see people from all around the world uh, coming together to, to really wrestle with how to, how to do this right, how to improve our craft and, and kind of serve the world by hopefully increasing the ratio of, of signal to noise and you know, out-competing misinformation and nonsense when it comes especially to controversial subjects where, where, there's, you know, where it's so common to see Kind of bad information spread widely. Um, so, you know, covering controversies can be, it can be fun, it can be exciting, and uh, framing things as controversies or identifying controversies can be a really good way to get people engaged in a story, uh, including people who don't have a lot of knowledge about a given subject, you know, which is common, you know, and when we're covering health science environment issues, we want everybody to be welcomed into our stories and and putting things into kind of a formula that they understand is a good way to bring people in. Uh, and controversies are a trope. It's a trope that we see all the time in politics or sports. You know, during the Olympics, we're gonna see a lot of rivalry stories to get people excited about sports that they might not normally cover or pay too much attention to. So it's a it's a powerful frame, but it it's often either misused or even weaponized uh, to, for, <laughs> for, for, for ill, for, for evil. Um, so I want to talk about you know how to, how to do it right, how to watch out for you know how not to do it, and how to kind of outcompete the, the the misuses of, of, of controversy as a frame. And so I, I find it helpful to think about uh, three kind of basic types of controversies. Um, and the first is the real legitimate controversies about science, uh, which are interesting and important, and often make good stories. Uh, the second one is is false controversies that are Kind of spun to look like legitimate scientific debates, um, but actually don't have two, two even sides or don't have two legitimate sides. And then um, finally, there's policy controversies uh, that typically in, in most of the coverage you see are not usually informed by science, but they actually should be science stories. And I think this is an area of opportunity for science journalists. You know, when, I, when I say science, I mean science, health, environment, technology, like any journalists who care about evidence and scholarship. Um, this is an opportunity for all of us to sort of improve the coverage of these controversial issues and to, to drive the conversation to a more, um, a more informed, in, in a more informed direction. So uh, the first kind, the legitimate controversies, those are fun. Those are things like, you know, where on earth did life first evolve? You know, was it in shallow ponds? Was it in deep sea vents? Was it in geysers? Uh, there's like all kinds of interesting competing theories about that. Uh, things like, um, can geoengineering or should geoengineering be used to mitigate um, certain aspects of climate change? Um, what are the, you know, the costs and benefits of gain of function research? Um, things like who deserves credit for developing CRISPR? Uh, these are all kind of you know, interesting questions uh, that aren't entirely settled. And so they can, they can make for fun stories. And uh, you know, when you're covering controversies, or, you know, there's some, some things, some kind of basic principles to keep in mind. And um, what is it that, you know, 
the more controversial something is, the more people you want to interview about it, and the more deeply you want to interview them. Uh, so it's really important to understand what is the range of opinion, um, how did you, you know, what's the evidence for each side, you know, if it's a the two side thing, what, what is the basis of the evidence? Um, are people who aren't invested or, or couldn't profit from one side or the other, where are they falling? Uh, where, you know, where do the ideas come from? You know, the whole history of, of you, know, really, you really need to deeply understand what are the different sides of this controversy and report more deeply than you would for maybe for a basic discovery story. And one of the other kind of tricky things um, is to make sure that your experts are the right and the real experts. Uh, one of the you know, problems we've seen with, with some of the coverage of the COVID pandemic is uh, there's, there's kind of this problem of, of what are called armchair epidemiologists. So people who have expertise in some other area of science and may have, you know, may have tenure at prestigious universities and, and be credentialed in various ways, um, but they're passing themselves off as experts in this particular pandemic and sometimes you know, spreading you know, unhelpful or misleading information. Uh, this is a problem you often see just, you know, I think a lot of you probably know this, but if you don't, beware of Nobel laureates. Um, they can speak with great brilliance about whatever they want a Nobel in, um, but once somebody gets one of those prizes, something happens to some of them and they suddenly think they're an expert in absolutely everything and will opine on absolutely everything. So you wanna be you know, just really careful to kind of screen out the, the overconfident um, but under-informed people who will say, you know, sell themselves as experts. And this, if you're not familiar with the phenomena, there's a, a research literature on what's called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is that people who don't know so much about an issue often think that they know a lot. So there, there's, it's kind of a, a way of, of quantifying and, and identifying overconfidence. Uh, and it's something you see a lot. I mean, controversial subjects just seem to attract the overconfident and underinformed. And another thing to keep in mind as you're covering legitimate controversies is to, to be really precise about what the controversy is. Um, and this is particularly important when you're covering health stories. So you just wanna be sure that you're not implying that there's a doubt about the overall legitimacy of like chemotherapy or antibiotics or, or some um, type of treatment for disease even as you're um, discussing a controversy about, say, um, you know, how how long should the course of antibiotics be, or what can you do to prevent antibiotic resistance, you just want to make sure that that in in your coverage that you're very clear about what's what's not controversial as well as where the controversy lies. Um, and we can talk about all kinds of tips and other examples of, of legitimate controversies. Um, but the second kind is uh, the the false controversies. Uh, these are subject scientific subjects that are basically settled scientifically, um, but for all kinds of, uh, you know, all kinds of reasons, uh, there are people who claim that they're still controversial. And some of the classic examples are evolution. So evolution is the basis of basically everything we know about life on earth and perhaps beyond. And, um, but there's still plenty of people who say evolution, you know, is a hoax, it's made up, it's satanic. Um, and that the earth is 6,000 years old and, you know, and evolution isn't, isn't proved, it's just a theory. Uh, so that, you know, that, that it's, it's, it's a fake controversy. It's not a scientific controversy. It's a kind of a battle between religion and, and a certain kind of religion and science. And things like the danger of tobacco smoke. Um, and in that case, uh, that was, this was very intentional that the um, uh, cigarette manufacturers uh, weaponized one of the principles of science of being sort of cautious and iterative and uh, you know, expressing error bars and things like that to, uh, to, to sort of amplify the idea that, oh, it's not settled yet, it's not proven yet. And, um, and you see the same thing with climate science uh, where uh, big oil is basically like big tobacco and that they're uh, manufacturing doubts. And there's a really good book by Naomi Oreskes about this and about the history of it, how um, ExxonMobil and other companies have um, systematically tried to suppress the science and, and say, oh, it's not proven. You know, here's the other, these other alternative theories and we should teach the controversy. And then right now, especially what we're seeing uh, is, uh, is the old you know, settled question of vaccines. Um, even with the COVID vaccine, we have you know, abundant evidence that they're super safe, super effective. They're saving people's lives, but there's still this sort of manufactured controversy over whether people should be vaccinated or are, you know, do the vaccines work? Are they putting you know, chips in you, uh, some kind of chips in you or things like that. And often you, know, you get uh, conspiracy theories are kind of woven into the false controversy. So some of the weaponization of, of these fake false controversies uses 
um, some related principles of, in journalism that have to do with fairness. Um, so they, they're you know, the principles that a lot of us have learned in journalism school or have had it posited by editors, things like the objective, uh, show both sides of any debate and show don't tell. And the principle of show don't tell in its best form basically replaces adjectives with action. So instead of just calling somebody a bully, you would show examples of him being a bully to other people and let the reader realize, oh gosh, that guy's a bully. And in some senses, in some cases that makes sense and it's good practice, but I think you can do both. And I think we should do both more often. And I think sometimes bully is the proper word for something and we should use our words. And if something's a lie, we should call it a lie. If something is racist, we should call it racist. If you know, the climate emergency, we should call it a climate emergency. We should be really clear with our language and use the, the strongest and clearest language rather than kind of leaving it up to the reader to, to pull the pieces together and have this epiphany when they're in a rush and they might not have the, you know, the full background to really comprehend what these examples mean. And um, of course, the both sides is of it. I, I think Melba's gonna talk more about this too, is that um, you know, this, the ideal is that you would present two sides of, of any debates or, and, and kind of let the readers uh, decide based on you know, the, the two best arguments. And that could be fine if the arguments are equally supported, but it's actually pretty rare for there to be a debate with two equal sides and anybody you know, can and should just pick a side and, and, and say that that's right or that's wrong. Uh, and you know, it's asking a lot, they're reading quickly. Um, and and these, are, these are both kind of in, in service of this great journalism principle of objectivity, uh, which is that of course the reporter shouldn't come in with any preconceived notions and, and should be fair and represent everything fairly, which is true. But what we've seen um, in the past few years is that journalists are increasingly realizing that there's that objectivity, of course, is, a, is an important principle, but truth is a higher principle than that. And sometimes objectivity gets in the way of truth, and truth is more important. And so, and I think as science reporters, as people who are interested in you know using evidence, looking at the research, looking at you know how how do we know things, um, I think we have a lot in our field to teach political reporters about how. Um, you can judge the truth and you can be straight about the truth and tell people the truth rather than just explain both sides. So um, when you're covering one of these false controversies, um, you don't need to present both sides. Uh, you present the science and then you can explain that there is this other side or there, there is this other point of view, um, but always say clearly that it's based on debunked information or fraudulent claims, or it's a widely circulating conspiracy theory with no evidence. Um, when possible, explain that the people who are promoting the theory are also profiting from it, which is usually the case. Uh, and if something's just false, label it as false. Um, if the president says something false, say the president said this false thing, rather than just the president said this thing. Um, and this is especially true for headlines, which is often the only thing that people encounter. Um, so just be, and, and another thing it, you kind of have to, it can be frustrating, especially if you're covering, say, vaccines a lot, um, or climate science a lot, to, to endlessly kind of, you, you might feel like you're repeating yourself a lot, but any given reader might be coming to this subject for the first time or for the first time in a while. So it's really important to just repeat, here's how we know what's true. Here's how we know this thing that people believe is however not true um, and just explain it every time to make the story kind of welcoming and clear for people who don't quite understand what the fuss is about and think, okay, well, if there's a controversy then there must be some legitimate difference of opinion. Uh, and you have to be really clear to, to show that this, this type of controversy is, um, you know, people disagree, but it's, it's not that the evidence is controversial. And so for the third kind, um, you know, there are a lot of really interesting policy controversies and um, a lot of them aren't typically presented as science stories, um, but they should be. So for example, right now, um, there are tax credits for people, for families with children, uh, through, um, you know, the, and I think the money is starting to be dispersed uh, this week. And so this would be a good time to, to run a story about universal basic income uh, and, and what is the evidence for it and how do we know it works. Um, there's going to be a lot of, uh, a lot of debate over abortion rights, uh, you know, as the Supreme Court considers some challenges to Roe versus Wade. And this is often presented as a story about values, um, but it's also, it's a story about healthcare and it's a story about um, you know access to proper basic medical care, and uh, you know as as it as it gets loaded down as as just a political issue or a horse race issue, 
I think this is where science and, and health and environment reporters can come in and, um, and really explain, okay, here's, here's the evidence. Um, it's not dangerous for women. Women don't regret the, their abortions, almost never do. Um, and you know, here are the health consequences of denying abortion or denying uh, reproductive medicine services. Um, so this, you know, obviously this is giving you an opportunity um, over the, you know, the upcoming years. And there are other things that are presented as uh, policy controversies, like should a community fluoridate its water? And this is another one where the, seven, you know, the, the science is quite clear that fluoridation works and it prevents ca cavities and it's a big, great public health benefit. And um, this is a place where science reporters can swoop in and, and you know, explain things very clearly uh, when, you know, when, when it's being presented, say, by political reporters as just a, a fight between two factions on a, on a city council. Um, and you know, this is especially the case when it comes to health insurance. Um, you know, ac expanding access to health care is a political issue, but the evidence shows that it literally saves lives. Um, there's going to be a lot of, you know, there, there's always a lot of debate about gun, uh, gun control and gun rights. And you know, the evidence there is overwhelming that if you buy a gun, it doesn't protect you, even though people say they buy it for protection, it's much more likely to cause harm to somebody in your family or to, or to cause an accident or to be used for suicide. So there are all these, um, you know, all these subjects that we should be aggressively covering and using you know, the tropes of, of um, controversy to help get attention for the things we know and help people understand and appreciate the things that we can explain to them as, as science journalists. So that's just a, a quick overview. Um, looking forward to hearing uh, Kendra and Melba too, and then we'll all you know, have, a, have a lively discussion at the end. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Laura. And one of the first questions uh, to, to none of our surprises about the uh, origins of COVID. I'm actually gonna hold that question until after everyone has a chance, because I think that one's probably gonna um, spawn some discussion. But one, one thing I, I did wanna um, ask you is, um, and maybe this is a little bit um, aside, but there are, uh, there are facts that are not in dispute, you know, in the scientific community, but then there are things that actually are um, facts and labels and names and words that themselves are very uh, much in contention. And I'm thinking about things like uh, place names. Um, you know, we know that maps, if it's, if it's a map from this country, it's described one way, if it's from this country, it's another, and it's very much in, in contention. Those aren't necessarily scientific controversies per se, but it's things that can come up in that reporting. I'm wondering um, when you have come across those sorts of situations, how you have handled them. Um, and I suspect this is something that others you know, deal with, uh, especially in this audience. Yeah, that's a good question. It comes up a lot. And, um, you know, it, a lot of a lot of places will have a, a style guide that set you know, specifically to the question of maps that will say you know we call this country you know, Burma or Myanmar, and um, of course you do what the style guide says and usually that you know the copy editor has a lot of control over that. But I find it really um, kind to the reader to you know add in parentheses what the other terms are, and that there's a debate or why there's a debate, which is just a you know it's a it's a fascinating. Um, part of the world that a lot of people aren't aware of that, you know, that, that place names are so important. And it's, it's kind of a little gift to have that you know, extra bit of information, extra bit of context for people to help appreciate you know, why this part of the world is important. Um, but yeah, language really matters. And so we have to, I think, both be you know, very thoughtful about what words we use and, and share with the reader why we're making certain word choices. Great, thanks. Yeah, I think the idea of, of sharing the why with the reader is really is really valuable and important. Um, well, thank you. Well, we're going to come back to you, I know. Um, and uh, but for now, we're going to hand it over to Melba. So, Melba, take it away. Oh, you're you're muted, Melba. Yes, I was. There you go. <laughs> well, thank you, and uh, thank you for having me. And I feel like it, Laura, such a tough act to follow and Kendra is a tough act to come before so uh, but they're both science writers I'm more of a general interest writer who covers science sometimes but um, I did and and I think by doing that I have a, a window to some of the issues that come up when we write about um, how we get trapped into as journalists doing the false balance thing where we feel we have to give equal weight to both sides and um, which can be a real trap for us because that's how we're trained. And um, just starting off, 
I remember uh, years ago, well, first of all, nowadays it's hard to name any topic that's not considered controversial. <laughs> Whatever I report on, I don't care if it's, you know, what's the cute dog that doesn't cause your allergies to go crazy or whatever. Somebody will tell me, you know, we'll, I'll get a mean letter saying I shouldn't be promoting, you know, mixed breeds or whatever. But everything is, is controversial. So you're going to annoy somebody because people have basically chosen sides for every single thing that you can possibly imagine. So what I just uh, try to do, and I think that's a good lesson for us to just focus on the facts and telling the truth and, and not worrying about balance. So I remember years ago, a friend of mine, we were in this argument about whether some, I don't remember what it was about, but she said, what we need is just pure science. We need pure science and that's what we would follow. And, and I was thinking at the time, no, you wouldn't, because right now you are rejecting pure math. We were having, we had had an argument ab about whether um, George Bush inherited a surplus and turned it into a deficit or not. And she was saying, well, it was because Clinton left him dirty money or something. And I was like, I don't even know what that means. But so if you are telling me that you can't even accept that this is, uh, that math is math, then when science comes along, you're going to find a way to uh, discount that. And that was 15 years ago or something. So I since lost touch with Susan. Make, basically, I kind of broke ties to save my own sanity. But I bet you somewhere Susan is calling the pure science that she said she would never go against, you know, BS, if it uh, doesn't line up with her beliefs. So I think the notion of balance is something that we chase as this optimal, you know, something that shows that we are the best journalists if we uh, present both sides. But um, balanced jur journalism, balanced reporting can be considered good journalism and it does have its virtues, but Journalism that presents all viewpoints with the same legitimacy, that undermines the basic tenets of, of science, which is like presenting conclusions based on evidence or being able to state fact is fact and call a lie a lie. So we've seen that play out in just about everything. So it is what drives uh, cable TV, not calling you know, they have two sides on and, and one side, they know they are diametrically opposed and they just let them have this screaming match and uh, because it makes for good TV and then the uh, moderator doesn't see him or herself so a lot of times as a, a referee or an umpire to call you out one side when, when someone says something true, they see themselves as a, a ringmaster to gin up and create a good show. And, and sometimes I think we can do that, you know, in reporting. Well, the, the cable host will say, they'll after seven or eight minutes of screaming, they just say, well, we'll have to leave it there. So, which is basically, well, we gave you the information and you decide. Um, I think that's kind of terrible for <laughs> journalism, if that's what you can call it. And because it's as if we can't, there is no objective truth that the best we can do as journalists is just to present quote, both sides when we know where the evidence uh, stands. So good science journalism doesn't air both sides of a debate when only one side is correct. But many mainstream publications still do that sometimes. So you simply don't see that in legitimate science publications like Scientific American or Science or Science News or whatever. And but we've seen because the last two, the last almost going on two years, the biggest stories in the country and in the world have been science stories. 
everybody's reporting on it. It's not just coming from science reporters. Every publication, every outlet is reporting on, uh, you know, not just science, science reporters, but everybody's reporting on the pandemic and uh, vaccines. And in that way, I think some of the same both siderism is happening and things are, people it are giving, I don't want to say everybody is, but there seems to be some, I think that's why some things have gotten out of um, larger than they should be. Like as if there is real controversy about the vaccine. And, you know, when we know that there's not. And by airing that and, and people being afraid to say that so much of this is conspiracy theories, then what, what we have is that going farther and farther along and people choosing sides mostly um, sometimes based on their political beliefs and you know we're letting anybody on the on the air or quoting different people who just have an opinion like Laura was saying just because they may have a degree in one thing or you know fancy letters after their name in one instance we act as if they know about immunology and things that were you know how we uh, create vaccines and so we it can be a bad you know, a bad practice to act as if journalists have to be all the time just independent and we don't have an opinion. Fact and opinion are two different things. If, you know, people, if 500,000 people or 600,000 people are dying of the coronavirus, then we can say that without acting like we have, um, that we're putting our thumb on the scale for somebody, uh, for one side or the other. If reporting on people who say absurd things because it makes a good story, that kind of undermines um, just the whole, like I said, the premise of journalism and, and of science. So when we talk about, I, I did say that, you know, science journalism doesn't, doesn't do a lot of that, but I can think about when we, 30 years ago, there really wasn't a big controversy about climate science, climate science and about the earth warming. And, and um, until the fossil fuel industry decided to make it a controversy because it was in their interest too. And I think at that time, a lot of science journalists or journalists in general did the you know, you go, go out and you get an opinion from this side and you get an opinion from that side and that kind of started the reporting. And it allowed a lot of that fraudulent research or, you know, as Laura mentioned about the people for the merchants of doubt who made it a practice to sow that doubt about the climate science. It allowed that to take hold and, and now this is it's like the genie we can't put back in the bottle because they, for scientists will say the climate is real, but that has gotten into the bloodstream. And now that climate, chi climate change is all a hoax. And I think that started because we gave a platform to people who were making up their own science. And now science reporters don't do that, but how are we going to get that genie back in the bottle? And now you can basically tell where somebody's political, you know, where they are politically based on, um, I mean, where they stand on climate change uh, based on where they are politically, because everybody seems to have taken, taken a side. And I work with, you know, talk to some reporters and say, you know, I really I, this is how I feel, but in my neighborhood, I can't say that, or in my community, I can't say that because I'm going to get so much backlash and so much bad mail coming back to me if I say that. 
And I understand that, but I, on the other hand, I say, so what? What are you afraid about, you know, getting, you know, bad mail? What's it gonna do to you? It's just like when people were complaining about what Trump said in public, you know, his uh, other Republicans were complaining and, and private, they wouldn't say anything because they were afraid he was going to tweet at them. So what? You go through all this and you're afraid of a tweet. You know, you 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 are journalism, you go through journalism school and you're afraid to say this because somebody's gonna write you a mean note. This is your job to tell the truth. And if it makes people uncomfortable, then so be it. You know, but that that is the price. It's not even the price, but it's the responsibility. And, and if people feel that they can cow you just by uh, writing you a mean note when you are telling the truth and just be prepared to, to stand by it, then some people who write the things, they aren't even subscribers anyway, so who, who cares? But I see it, uh, that's just another way of, um, of following kind of a bad precedent of being afraid or wondering about what the readers are going to say. But as long as you have the facts on your side, and I think, you know, the facts are on our side when we talk, when we talk about those things. So when one of the things too that I want to say is how much attention should we give these stories like the anti-vaxxers and the uh, climate science deniers. And I know a lot of times I've had uh, people come to me with stories and they're very well-meaning because they want to debunk these conspiracy theories and like, let's write a story and, and show how this is wrong. And I don't really, I think sometimes that's a waste of time and it's also maybe goes in the, in the wrong direction because it can bring more attention to, to this. And it, it blows the issue up bigger than I think it would be a lot of times. And I don't think we convince anybody. Anybody who believes that the earth is flat or the moon landing was fate, do you really think you're gonna convince them with you know one story in a paper? You know, I just, I don't think that. And I think they love the attention sometimes. I just remember when, some, when early on, when Trump first said that he thought maybe, I may be a little bit of a birther. He said a little bit of a birther and it got so much attention and everybody came running to him and said, you don't believe that Obama was born in this country? You don't believe this? You, and he got so much attention and he doubled down on it. He kept saying it because it just blew up like crazy. And then he became the biggest birther because why? He worked for him. It got him what he craved and which was attention, which I think if ever, and people were going, they were trying to show him this and they were trying to show him that. And I just, it's been documented that people who believe in conspiracy theories, the more evidence you show them to try to debunk the conspiracy theories, the more uh, they believe that that's part of the conspiracy and the more committed they become to that, uh, to that conspiracy theory. So I think it's kind of a, a you know, we kind of go around in a circle with that and we're wasting a lot of time. And I think personally, I'd rather spend the reporting on showing what is and documenting real, you know, real science and, and, and not getting wrapped up into these fake controversies and giving a side and giving time to quote equal sides when the other side isn't really equal at all. Uh, because I just think it furthers their agenda. When you look at how Andrew Wakefield, the guy who started the whole vaccine to uh, autism thing, the guy, he's, that was 20 years ago. It's been debunked. Uh, that study was, you know, pulled. He's been struck off of the British, you know, medical list. 
And 20 years later, people are still citing that as proof. So when people want to believe something, they, they kind of will. So I just try to focus on, you know, reporting, applying like scientific principles to reporting and not falling into the trap of false balance. So one of the things that I wanted to say was things that we need to think of when we're considering reporting on a story for me about pitching a story is to not get caught up in the chasing the shiny object. You know, there's every day there's some miracle cure for something or whatever. And um, so thinking about what's the source of the message. And what is the agenda or the goal of the message or the, you know, the messenger? And I think about that as, as far as pursuing a story and also who to include in the stories that I'm reporting on. Because again, to repeat what Laura said, people can have great credentials, but if I am reporting on a story about climate science, I want someone who's an, you know, earth or environmental scientist, not a biological science scientist. So those things really matter. And, um, and if someone has a, has a position that they want to advance, they can hire someone often, you know, that's kind of the, the trope is to get someone who has great degrees, like Laura was saying, maybe a Nobel laureate who is in a totally different area, but people don't look deeper than that to see what their expertise is in. And then they can get quoted a lot of time and so a lot of doubt because it is, it's been proven that it's almost just enough to, you can't, if you can't debunk climate science just to raise doubt about it. And that has been enough to keep us from doing anything. Uh, seriously for the past 30 years to say we don't know enough and um and Alba, i'm going to interrupt you here with a, a quick question then we need to move on to to kendra yeah. um but i there was a question here from um uh and forgive me i hope i pronounce this name correctly lai shay so um who asks um false controversies are in her opinion often pitched towards folks at lower education or socioeconomic levels and they may not be consuming the kinds of publications that you all work for the New York Times, Scientific American, and so on. A lot of them are getting from TV reporting, as you mentioned, Melba. Um, you know, here's eight minutes of people shouting at each other, we're out of time, let's move on. Mm -hmm. And so she asks, um, what are the options for trying to reach these folks and engage them in dialogue and present evidence um, if they're not looking at the kinds of places like Scientific American, New York Times? Do you have thoughts about this at all? And again, just, just a few seconds, then we'll move on to Kendra. Uh, well, yeah, move on to Kendra, because I told that is the $100,000 about trying to reach, reach those people. But, it, you know, because it is, and I think that's where they aim at, because that, that is the, that's the people where you can probably make the most inroads, that, and it's a big challenge. So. Yeah, and I would just add that that's partly what this webinar series in the handbook is about, is about giving this information to news outlets that people may be consuming that are not used to covering science. And right. so part of the idea here is actually to convey this information to those outlets. And, and that's why we're here. There are a lot more questions. We're going to get to them, I promise. But I'm going to um, uh, pitch it over to Kendra. Kendra, you're up. Um, hello. <laughs> um, can you hear me? You're good. We can hear you. Okay, awesome. Um, so I feel kind of like, thanks first of all to Joshua and MIT for having me today. And I feel like a little kid who didn't understand the assignment. So um, uh, I, because I wanna to begin today talking a little bit more philosophically about, um, and apologize in advance if there's background noise, I live on a street that's very popular with motorcyclists. Um, <laughs> um, but I wanna talk a bit more philosophically about the nature of journalism and more broadly and including the ways that journalism can cause harm before narrowing it down a bit to, to focus on today's topic, which is covering controversial science. And something that I've been thinking about a lot is if you're in the United States and if you're a journalist for long enough, 
someone will eventually tell you that journalism is such a noble profession that the country's founders in their infinite wisdom inscribed it into the constitution. The press, they will tell you, often smugly, is not just the only profession explicitly named in the Constitution, but it's the only profession protected by the Constitution. Um, and to these people's credit, they're at least partly right. It is in the Constitution, I checked, um, as any good journalist should, um, nestled right there in the First Amendment. It essentially says that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Freedom of speech or the press, freedom of the press. But freedom of the press to do what exactly? That's what I want to talk about today. That's what I want you to think about today. Um, the longer I'm a journalist, the more, the more the focus on the fact that journalism is in the Constitution bothers me. It bothers me for several reasons, but the one that I want to talk to you about today is that for me, it feels a little bit like name dropping. It gives journalism and by extension journalists credibility without having actually earned it. I am not a constitutional scholar, but the bit that I've gleaned by reading their works is that the constitutional protection of the press was in part a reaction to the British attempts to suppress it. Prior to independence, the British government tried to censor colonial presses by prohibiting them from publishing unfavorable information and opinions about the monarchy. It's hard to foment a revolution if you can't spread the word about your perceived problems. So it makes sense that, that they would eventually try and press protections into the constitution. And to be clear, there's data to support the benefits of a free and open press. This is not, I'm not about to go off script and tell you guys, you know, that the press is bad, <laughs> even in less revolutionary times. Um, a 2020 paper by Penji Gao, who's a professor of finance at Notre Dame, found that when local newspapers close, governments become less well run and more expensive. Research out of the London School of Economics, led by Felipe Campanti, I think is how you pronounce his name found that states with isolated capital, such as Sacramento in California, Tallahassee in Florida, or Albany in my home state of New York, were more correct, or more corrupt. One of the reasons the researchers noted was the media. They found that newspapers whose readers are closer to the capital tend to devote significantly more coverage to state politics and politicians. Sunshine, to quote of the former US Supreme Court justice, is the greatest disinfectant. But something that's outside of the scope of the studies and what I want you to think about today as we, as we sort of continue to delve into the subject of covering so-called controversial science is what is it about the media that can affect those changes? This isn't a philosophical question for me. As we said here today, Missouri and Arkansas are in the grips of a COVID-19 outbreak at levels not seen since January, a period before widespread vaccination was accessible. And while it's easy to point fingers Sorry, sorry, my phone ring. Uh, um, uh, and while it's easy to point fingers at politicians and public figures who have deliberately muddied the waters around COVID and vaccination, I'd argue that in the US, the media is in part complicit in the real harm that we are all facing. Some of that dates back more than 20 years to the ways in which it stoked anti-vaccination rhetoric more broadly, referencing that Andrew Wakefield story that um, Melba talked about. Um, but there are three ways I think that I wanna talk about today in which I think the media has contributed to the contentious nature of what we're facing, not just really as related to COVID-19, but also my area of coverage, which is climate change. The first, which is um, by being biased to the status quo. The second is in muddling the picture by giving disproportionate weight to fringe views, which I think Melba touched on quite well. And the third, which I will spend the bulk of my remaining time exploring is in response is in reporting on issues as the as readers are passive recipients of our governance systems and not active participants. Before I delve into this, I wanna be clear that there are reporters who have done incredible work in clarifying the best science and parsing through constantly shifting information. On COVID alone, off the top of my head, Ed Young, Maggie Kurth, Catherine Wu, and Roxanne Kamsi have all done admirable work. But in April of last year, the New York Times both cited drinking bleach after then President Trump suggested falsely that drinking bleach might cure the coronavirus. It should be stated that even before COVID, accidental ingestion of products like bleach was a leading source of accidental household poisoning. But over and over and over again, the press found themselves repeating his statements wholesale, completely oblivious to the concepts of media magnification or the ways in which media coverage of a topic gives it more attention and legitimacy. In fact, if one is not careful, even debunking an idea can lead to more people believing in it. Contrary to what Adam Smith would have had us believe more than two centuries ago, we are not rational beings. This is also seen in my second point, giving disproportionate weight to fringe views. 
in part because of euphemisms such as dog bites man is not a story, but man bites dog is. This kind of thinking is baked into journalism. As a climate reporter, we saw this for decades in the ways the media repeated lies that the climate science was unclear even well after the science was settled. With COVID in May of last year, the media gave significant coverage to open up protests. Um, for those of you not in the United States, these were protests designed to tell us to not to end our sort of me mediocre lockdown as it was, many of which early on were coordinated campaigns underwritten by special interest groups that had financial stakes in opposing lockdowns. This coverage happened even as survey data showed that the vast majority of people in the United States wanted lockdowns in place, and even as the media ignored socially distanced pro-lockdown protests. And there's parallels to this in climate change, despite the fact that climate denialists are in the vast majority, according to last December's April 6 America's Yale's 6 America survey, roughly 8% of people in the United States are denialists. But if you were to ask a denialist, they think that they are not maybe in the majority, but that as many as 30% of their fellow people in the United States are, share their viewpoint. It's just not true. But part of why they think that's true is because of the disproportionate weight the media has long given to climate denialists. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, the media treats participants as recipients of information and not participants in a democracy. I'm almost ashamed to admit that it was not until I became a climate reporter that I understood the public comment process. That is when an agency like the Environmental Protection Agency puts forward a proposed rule, the public has the ability to weigh in on said rule through a formal comment process. And yet typically when the press reports on these rules, even when the rule is in process, the reporting focus is on the rule is a thing put forth by the government that one side says this and the other side says this that will at the end of the day be imposed on some form on the public. The rules are presented as a fait accompli, as done deals. It's rare to mention that the reader has the ability and the right to participate in this rulemaking process. As a consequence, over and over again, the reporting favors those with understanding and influencing, failing the basic threshold of what a press should do, which is to inform people in ways to better engage with their society. In the case of climate change in particular, we have mostly moved past the era where the media is debating the science, a talking point that the work of Naomi Oreskes, Ar whom Melba referenced, and others had shown was pumped up by oil and gas companies. These same companies whose very own scientists were telling them by the late 1970s that climate was warming as a result of their own production. But this subject sort of didn't leave the media until almost the early 2000s. The bulk of the coverage nowadays is less on that kind of denialist, but it's so narrowly focused on the problem of climate change that many people who have only finally become aware of the problem think it is already too late to do anything about it. This too, it should be noted, is a climate denialist talking point. If the climate is warming and there's nothing we can do about it, shouldn't we continue burning fossil fuels? Of course, any decent climate scientist will tell you no. It matters how much carbon dioxide we pump into the atmosphere. To put it into even more concrete terms, we're currently on a train speeding towards a brick wall. In terms of our survival, it matters if we hit that wall at 30 miles per hour or 300 miles per hour. But that's not always clear from the way that the, climate, the media reports about climate. I understand the problem of climate change probably more than most. I've been reporting on it for years. But at some point, it felt like every year I was rewriting new versions of the story, of the same old story. So a little year, over a year ago, I started working on a podcast that was a little bit different. Instead of focusing on the problem of climate change, it would focus on the solutions of climate change. Our mandate was simple. We were not going to cover climate change from both sides, a which is a perspective I should admit that I first picked up from interning at Inside Climate News. The debate was over, they told me when I started, <laughs> the, the science is settled. On the podcast, we would look at the problems, yes, but we would also talk to people who are working to make changes within our system, system with, and we would look at them with a critical eye. Almost immediately, other journalists started asking me whether we qualified as activism, a dreaded word in journalism circles, and doubly so because anything that seems to take the next step in climate change beyond accepting and articulating the problem is often seen as activism. But it's unclear to me when I started, and it remains unclear to me now, why reporting on a problem is seen as journalism, but reporting on solutions is seen as activism, despite bringing the same rigor. Over and over again, the feedback that we've gotten from listeners is thank you. Thank you for helping me find a career path that I didn't know existed. Thank you, you've inspired me to insulate my attic. Thank you, you've inspired me to sit on a public hearing. And so I'm going to close with an example that I think about over and over and over again of a different period in, American, in US journalism dating back to the early 1900s in which um, the American press spent a lot of time reporting and shining a light on the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, which is a white supremacist organization in the United States. They wrote story after story detailing sort of the nefarious nature of the KKK and outlets won awards over their KKK coverage. 
but at the same time, their coverage was actually stoking membership in the KKK. One newspaper went so far as to actually print the recruitment form, a copy of the recruitment form in the newspaper, and readers learning about the KKK cut out the recruitment form and mailed it in. We, have an, we often talk about journalism as having an impact, but it can be a good or a negative impact. And I don't think it's an industry we've fully sort of absorbed the import and the ways in which that are, we can cause harm. Thank you. Thank you, Kendra, that was terrific. Really appreciate it. And, and I think very thoughtful. Um, we have a lot of questions and uh, uh, let's jump right into them. Uh, I promised one of the first ones we would get to and, and we can turn right to it which is, um, it comes from uh, uh, Jamon, um, who asks, how do you balance the public response to science driven by politics and students? Um, pardon me, I miss, I, I, that's not the one I meant to, to pull up, I apologize. Um, well, now I can't find it. But the question was basically about the uh, uh, origin of coronavirus. And this is an, I think this is actually a really interesting one to bring up because it is both, I think, a scientific controversy. You really do have scientists who are um, arguing with each other about uh, you know, what the evidence shows and where it may have come from and what seems reasonable. Perhaps I'm wrong. I know I'll be corrected if I am. And also a political question, uh, one that is imbued with, frankly, racism and political motivations and so on. And so it kind of touches on both sides of the, of the animating question of the webinar. Um, and so I'm curious what you all think of that. And Laura, I'm going to go ahead and start with you if you uh, want to address it. I know yeah. Scientific American has written extensively about this. So. Yeah, we. Um, it's a. You're absolutely right. This this kind of covers a, a bunch of different kinds of controversies. I mean, one one typical kind of controversy is just something that's unknown yet. Um, and and this, you know, we don't have definitive proof that the coronavirus um, spilled over from bats to humans, possibly through another species. And we absolutely don't have any evidence that it, that it was a lab accident that made the virus transfer from the Wuhan Institute of Virology into humans. Um, the over, you know, given what we know about other diseases, about other exposures, about what coronaviruses do in the wild, um, even what we know about lab leaks and you know, how viruses mutate in a lab versus in the wild versus in various species versus in the human population. I mean, the, the, the bulk of the evidence, I think the, the bulk of the, you know, the majority of the experts who are paying attention to this agree, yeah, it was almost certainly a, a spillover event that, that happened naturally and happens naturally and that will happen again and is probably happening right this instant. Um, but you, you can't, you know, it's not proven yet. And so there, you know, there is, there is a debate. There's, you know, some people interpret certain bits of the history to point towards a lab leak. Um, and that's, you know, thinking about that, you know, d discussing that evidence and, and debating, you know, which pieces of evidence are more relevant. Like that's certainly a legitimate controversy, a legitimate thing to, to, um, to, to argue about to, and to cover. Um, but yeah, it's all wrapped up in, in uh, in xenophobia, in you know, blame China, you know, hostility that's so common in the United States, especially during the Trump administration. A lot of the evidence comes from sources we wouldn't consider reliable um, commenters on 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 viruses, um, things like that. And you know, so uh, for, just to be transparent, Scientific American ran a profile of Xi Zheng Li, who's uh, one of the top virologists and and, and um, coronavirus experts in the world, uh, who works at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, still does. And um, our reporter asked her, you know, did, did you worry that this virus, um, which was you know, the first cluster was noticed in Wuhan, did you worry that it came from your lab? And she said, absolutely, I was terrified. And so she checked all their records and made sure, and, and it turns out that it didn't match any of the, the samples that they had been studying. So she said, yeah, we, we looked into this, we checked it, it wasn't from us, let's move on and fight this disease. Um, so from, you know, so that's, that's something we published in Scientific American. I, I still, I still find that compelling. I know other people um, have different things that they're looking at. If, if anybody is interested, the best, the best overview I've seen so far is um, by Justin Ling in, um, in uh, foreign policy. If you haven't seen that, it's called the lab leak theory doesn't hold up. And it's, it's, it does an exhaustive review of all the literature. And um, it also brings in the context of basically every time something bad happens, there's kind of the psychological phenomenon where we want to blame somebody, and whether it's a, you know an assassination, and so we, you know instead of blaming Lee Harvey Oswald, we want the you know the entire uh, geopolitical world to be involved. Um, you know when something really bad happens, it seems like the this, the 
the cause of it should be as big as the consequence. And, um, and so we see that with, with diseases over and over again, and it, they usually end up being natural causes. So, sorry, I, I could go on about this all day and I, I would love to hear what, what Kendra and Melba. Yeah, Kendra and Melba, do either of you have anything you wanna to add to this? Yeah, so I think of it a little bit differently, I think, than more it does, which is I think of it more in terms of whether or not it should be a media story, which is like, there are two sort of separate issues happening. There's a scientific debate and I'm more than like, they should be debating it like that, like there should be research and people should be going that like scientists should be going down that rabbit hole. But based on the existing evidence, what we know now has not sort of fundamentally changed in the past year and a half or whatever since COVID-19 sort of came out, right? Like what we know now is essentially what we know January, February, 2020. And so why are we giving it all of this attention? Why are we giving it all of this oxygen as a media outlet? It should be a one and done story, which is we don't know. And it might, it might be years before we figure it out, right? Like nothing is changing. The evidence isn't changing. What is changing is that there are people who have a vested interest, some of who, you know, like one of the most prominent sources of this is Nicholas Wade, who has written a whole like books that, and articles that traffic heavily in eugenics and, you know, racist troops against Asian people. He's been one of the biggest proponents of this. So there is a group of people that are pumping oxygen into this and making it and trying to turn it into a media story. And one of the things that we should know as journalists is like what not to report on. And essentially because nothing has fundamentally changed in a year and a half from a scientific perspective and from even from a, um, you know, they've done like DOD there, I think MIT Tech Review did a story where they were de like, they, you know, from a, I don't know, I'm gonna call it the spy agencies, but you know what I'm talking about? Like they did all of this, like, is there secret like stuff going on behind the scenes? Like nothing has changed. <laughs> like we don't know, like there's no new information. So why are we still talking about it, right? Like, and I think fundamentally like that kind of goes back to the philosophy of the press writing stories about lab leak gets clicked, writing stories that are like, this is the nature of how science is done and it could be three or four years out. And, and the other, my other kind of frustration with that is it doesn't fundamentally change what we need to do now. Whether or not it's a lab leak or not, like how we should be conducting our business and what we should be doing, it doesn't, like worst case scenario, like if it was a lab leak, we've got time, you know, China isn't going anywhere. Like there's time to seek retribution, right? Like the things that we need to do, that, do, do now to fix coronavirus, that doesn't change where the origin comes from. And so I don't understand, like for me, I just like, why are we talking about this? It's not interesting to me, the world is on fire. Like there are just other more pressing and immediate issues than going down this sort of public rabbit hole of trying to suss things out through backdoor conspiracy theories being played out in national media. I think I just, I'll just offer a thought, which is it seems like a difficult balance because there is an accountability aspect and accountability can lead to positive change around say, putting new rules in place for lab security and so on. But it's so tied up with these other issues, it's really hard to tease that out, I think. And we don't know no, that it was a lab leak, so pushing No, of course, forward. of course. But I, yeah, the, so reason, like, the reason that one might guess, pursue the question is from an accountability standpoint. Right, but they were already, I guess, what I they were already pursuing this. This was a line of reasoning that scientists sure, were already sure. doing. So not that, sure, that's, sure. I think, where my first... It's there's not no like new, there's like, no new data. Yeah, there's no new data yeah. and also people were already looking at this and it hasn't changed that people are looking at this. So why are we so obsessed and harping on it when there are other more immediate pressing issues? I know, I'm not disagreeing that there, it's not, it's a story that media should be tracking but not necessarily that we should be reporting on every day, which is right. a very different and important nuance. By the way, uh, several people have put links into the story that, that Laura mentioned and those are in the chat. Mel, I'll give you a chance to, to join in on this or if you want to pass, I can move on to another question to say quickly that some of the people who are most hot about this and pushing this and you know are driving it for for nefarious reasons are the same people who said that the COVID was a hoax in the first place so anyway you can't have it both ways it can't be this grand thing that happened that doesn't even exist so you know motives really matter here what's behind all this. Well, that actually leads into the next question I have. Uh, this one was posted from uh, somebody anonymously, which was, uh, uh, how do you handle research coming out of areas, uh, and I think that can actually be expanded beyond just geographic areas, uh, where there are political motivations, archeology span in Palestine, ecological work in Tibet. How do you make sure that you're covering important research without furthering, interest, furthering the interests of some of the people or a state? Um, and I, I think that question can be sort of broadened to there's motivations, people, people have all kinds of motivations for everything that they do, including scientists. How do you factor that in and, and you know, your coverage and the work that you do? Um, who would like to put their hand up for that first? So I'll jump up once. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I could take that one because at Scientific American, we, we publish a lot of um, experts writing about their own research. And uh, so, you know, whether it's in a condition like that or uh, covering research that is, you know, that has multiple motivation. I mean, you know, we all have, all scientists have reasons for studying what they study, whether it's just because they're interested or because, you know, they lost a, a loved one to a certain disease or whatever. And, and that should, where relevant, be part of the story. Like, what is the motivation for this research? Who's funding the research? Um, you know, what, how is the research being used for political ends if it is? And so I think disclosing and, and making that part of the story, it makes, it makes the story richer. Um, it makes it easier for readers to understand. Um, and it, you know, in, you know, requires a little bit more reporting to make sure that you understand if there are conflicts of interest or perceptions of conflicts of interest, what those are and how to present them. Um, but you know, in general, I think telling the audience about, about these relationships um, can make for a richer experience. Definitely, context always helps. Um, so there's a, a question here. Uh, this was directed specific, specifically at, at Laura, but really anybody can, can answer this. This is from Karen MacArthur. Do you have guidelines or stories you can tell us from your experience about how you might determine when a scientific controversy does have a clear truth to convey versus when there really isn't a clear scientific consensus? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. And, and it's often, you know, it's not one of these, okay, open question, closed question. A lot of times there's a spectrum and at some point you have to figure out, okay, now is the, you know, is the over, you know, is the overwhelming consensus in favor of this explanation or that explanation. And so I think some examples, like for instance, um, the, the announcement of life on Mars, that there were these little microfossils in uh, a meteorite that was knocked off of Mars, landed into Antarctica, and then researchers looked at it and said, wow, that looks a lot like microbes. And there was a you know, big, big announcement. NASA really went to town. Um, they used the full power of their press office and, and you know, just the, the wow and the excitement and had a you know, press conference at the White House. It was all very exciting. Um, and it took a while for the people who said, oh no, actually those are just geologic inclusions. Um, these are natural abiotic formations. Like it took a while for the for, for that debate to be to be played out, and it, you know there's still a few people who say okay maybe it was life, um, but it you know it was a process of months if not a year before science journalists could say okay that that idea was really exciting but it's it's over, um, and and I think that's often what happens. Sometimes it can be immediate, where, you know, where there'll be a, a quick response on Twitter where you know something that was peer reviewed and published maybe shouldn't have been maybe they didn't get the proper peer reviewers and so it kind of got through and and got published and got a lot of attention and. And pretty quickly, um, it's one thing social media is really good at is is having people say, "Oh no, this is you know this is a calibration error. It's not that we discovered um, you know faster than light communication or transmission. It's that somebody didn't calibrate their their sensors right." And so sometimes it can be exposed immediately, and but sometimes it can take you know years for for the evidence to finally mount and to to finally realize, okay, yeah, it looks like this question is settled. Is that partly a problem of the of the metabolism, if you will, of, of the scientific process and the journalistic process. They're just on two different time scales. Yeah, that's I think that's a really good point. And and also, you know, there's this news people are, are always looking for what's new and looking for what, what happened just now. And uh, and so it, I think it's another opportunity where journalists can take something that was a controversy a while ago and it have a really kind of more satisfying story that doesn't just end with and more research is needed. That can come back and say, "Here's a here's a controversy. Scientists were wondering about it for decades, and the, the question is finally answered. And here's the answer. And that that can be a really satisfying, you know, often a magazine story that I think a lot of journalists miss because they're so busy looking for the next, you know, the next little step." Um, Melba, I want to direct this question. Uh, this question is directed to you from RB. Um, brought up the issue of false experts, and the question is, why do journalists continue focusing on obtaining opinions of, of experts? Who may or may not know the subject matter, wouldn't it be more reasonable to do what researchers do in science by, sci by citing scientific journal articles for expertise in the subject matter for science-based news articles? Well, when, so, I, when I quote an expert, that's who I'm, you know, who I try to get, somebody, a researcher, someone who's done uh, the research and published in this area. I don't just look at look for some talking head on TV who's been, you know, on CNN for the last six weeks. So that's what, if I'm 
doing a story, I usually look for someone who's been published in peer review journals or anything, you know, something like that. That's what I consider an expert. I'm a journalist, so I can, I don't, you know, I think Laura and, and Kendra, but they are specifically, you know, science journals have this background. So they are in a better position to evaluate like the raw data and research and everything. But how would I, I'm sorry about that, know what is about, you know, who's a better expert or whatever. I rely on the publications from uh, peer review journals to determine who I'm going to quote or include in a story. And then I rely on my the next level up, my editors like Laura and Josh and people at Scientific American to uh, come back and say, I think we need to bring somebody else in here, you know, or bring in this is a study that conflicts with that or something like that. Perfect. Um, maybe a series of kind of lightning round questions here. I think these are probably quick answers. Um, uh, Alec and Andra uh, asks, what is the best way to find credible sources for a controversial topic in science? Anybody want to jump on that one? Uh, yeah, so typically, you know, as, as Melba was saying, we, we look for who's been publishing in this field. Um, you know, look on PubMed, look at other databases, um, see who's published in, you know, fairly uh, prestigious journals. Um, and look at you know kind of look at the citation trail, and uh, and also who's you know who's given big talks at, at professional um, scientific organizations and things like that, and and also um, it, you know, it's it's very social it's very networky I mean science sometimes it gets presented as this objective search for reality um, where we're successful successively peeling back the layers, um, but it's a social process and people know people and so. A lot of times when somebody's interviewing a scientist, they'll say, who else should I talk to? And so there's kind of a chain. And you know, once you know you've done enough reporting, when you keep hearing the same names over and over, and there's nobody beyond who you've already talked to. Um, I'll just add that we have a chapter actually in the handbook specifically on um, sourcing science stories. And there's a bunch of tips in there. Um, some of the ones that Laura just mentioned are, are certainly uh, listed there as well. So you can look there for some additional information. So um, a few maybe kind of quick questions. Um, uh, probably, well, uh, this one from Betsy. Kendra, thank you for shining the light on the issue about when stories keep getting printed on topics that have dangerous consequences. Does the responsibility lie with the editor for perpetuating this issue? Uh, sorry, Laura, but yes, I think so. <laughs> because ultimately they have veto power. And, and it goes the other ways too, where I've definitely written a story or two under duress where I was like, I don't think we should be doing this. And went ahead and like did it where every sentence was like, essentially me crying out for help and, <laughs> and being like, don't actually trust this study. I think it's bad. Um, so I think ultimately the buck stops with the editor. That's why they're the editor. Um, so I agree. And if I could just add to that, that like the most course. important thing an editor can do is say no to bad story ideas and to resist pressure from above them. Uh, and that's especially the case in newspapers. That, you know, I've experienced at the Post, Kendra at the Times, really bad ideas start really high on the masthead sometimes. And it is not easy to say no to people up high on the masthead, but that's something editors have to do. It's absolutely crucial. Um, and it shouldn't be up to the reporter to do it. Or the editor should be protecting their reporters from those bad ideas. So Laura, do you have, can you maybe go in a little more detail into how you say no? I mean, I, I, my guess is you can't simply, you don't simply say, no, sorry, and move on. But you need to provide a rationale and, and, and maybe educate the, the, the senior editor um, above you. I, not, to, not to answer for you, but can you go into a little more detail about how you do it? Some strategies that people may want to use. Yeah, very delicately. And there's also a problem, you know, a lot of a lot of newspapers, especially, are run by people who came up through politics. And so they see everything as a horse race, a controversy, a legitimate controversy where you just have to show both sides. And so why wouldn't you get the best quote from an anti-vaccine activist who's, you know, fundraising around this and selling like fraudulent vitamin D that they claim will stop COVID? Um, and so there, there's certainly a, quite a bit of education that goes into it. People in positions of power in the news business tend to not always be open to being educated. Um, so a lot of times it's, it's diverting and it's saying, well, why don't we do a story 
about the origins of this conspiracy theory or that's you know a story about how healthcare workers are trying to um, you know outcompete the misinformation rather than you know putting it as a controversy about which information is real or not. Um, but it, it's a challenge, and and a lot of bad things happen because um, because of putting you know Kendra like beautifully laid out some of the problems and there are so many problems in journalism and some of the sort of expectations about what's a story and what's an important story really kind of guide how people understand the world in a way that doesn't fit. Um, with evidence-based subjects. And not to beat a bush, but on the other side, if you're a reporter and you're in this position, there, there's, there's one reporter I know who is almost like gifted at kind of getting them to forget that they wanted him to do this thing <laughs> um, that he did not want to do. And then the other thing he was really good at when he, when he was sort of in a position where he had to do it, like there was just no way of getting out of it, is he would write these stories that told you effectively nothing. So if you've ever read a story and you've gotten to the end and you're like, I have learned, like, why does this story exist? That's often a story that came up from on high and was given to a reporter who was good enough to not deliver the thing that they should deliver because the thing that they want is bad. <laughs> in both of those cases, I think being able to uh, what well, jujitsu is the art of using someone else's strength against yeah. them to, to pivot on them, to divert, to use that jujitsu. I think that's a, 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 a tremendous skill to, uh, to develop. And, uh, Laura, it sounds like you've developed it quite well. No, I wasn't um, good at it. He was, he was like a master. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a kind of group of questions here that I'm going to kind of group together here, which is basically about, um, the, and it's and in some ways similar to what we we're just talking about. The, um, the, the frequency and the ease with which it is to um, uh, uh, you know, make something um, um, bigger than it is to, to sort of gin up the um, effect of it, whether it's through a headline or through a, a, a photo of, in this case, like a, a vaccine being administered to a screaming child or what have you. Um, can you. Can you speak to a, a little bit to the work, the education that needs to go into those, those sort of ancillary things in journalism that actually have an outsized effect on the reader in terms of how they're interpreting the, the story. Yeah, I was really blessed at my last job to work with an incredibly, incredibly gifted art director because one of the problems with climate change as a subject is it's actually not very visible often. Um, and one of the reasons why at this time of year we seem to get the most climate change stories is not just because you know, there are catastrophic wildfires, it's because wildfires are very photogenic and so it becomes an easy story for outlets to tell. And so one of the reasons why she was so gifted is you just have to have a very different mindset. You know, We did a lot of work with illustrators. We did a lot of um, more thematic work. Um, for that reason, but it is, you know, you have to be, you have to have the right people, you have to have the people who are willing to learn, you have to have people who are willing to be taught and you have to, you, the thing that I, I think is just a real struggle is that people, is there really just, it's not a fundamental understanding of the ways in which journalism can prop up misinformation. And so it becomes this education and trying to explain to people why they can't, why a thing can't happen. Like I had a thing once where I had a really funny quote in a story, um, but it was a lie and I wanted to debunk it kind of right away. And my editor wanted to save it for the kicker because it would have more effect. And I agreed with him that it would have more effect, but there's a really big thing where if you introduce a lie, you need to say it's a lie pretty much immediately. Um, also because a lot of people aren't gonna to read to the end of a story. And he, it was a fight that I wasn't able, you know, he wouldn't let me do that. He was like, it's ruining the flow. And I was like, I hear you. Like, it's very weird to have the reporter be like, I don't care about my flow. I want the, <laughs> but, and so but ultimately I pulled it. And so part of that is you have to be willing. I pulled the quote entirely because I was not willing to put in misinformation in that way. And so ultimately there's also an element of you having to be willing to have those conversations and kind of be a little bit annoying. That's a really interesting um, example because I mean, what you're really saying is you, you elevated the responsibility over the impact or effect of you know of the story. I'm, I'm probably not phrasing it quite right, but I think that hopefully the gist of what I'm saying is is clear. It may have been a more dynamic or a more uh, a, a effective um, piece of writing, but the responsibility of conveying the information accurately and have, leaving the reader with the right impression outweighed that. And I think that's that's actually a very brave thing to do. Um, and it strikes me maybe, and Melba, maybe you can speak to this. Um, 
that some of what we're talking about isn't necessarily that um, folks don't know to do these things, but almost they need permission. Um, and, and that the sort of journalistic structure is set up such that, you know, being more sensational, getting clicks, you know, um, doing what your editor tells you to do, th those are the motivations and the things that people are used to. Um, even if they kind of know internally, geez, I should push back on this. And that, you know, really it's about giving people permission to do what's right. Um, is that something that I think maybe you were speaking a little bit about let's do to, to that earlier. Um, and is that something that you've experienced where you've just had to sort of, um, I don't wanna say stand up for what's right, but but express that. I do, and I, I don't think I have to do it as much as a freelancer as I would have to do if I were on staff because I don't pitch stories that I don't want to write. If, if I were on staff, people assign me stories and you know, sometimes I try to pitch more stories. So, and people are like, oh, this, do you get assigned stories? I try to avoid that because often it's something that I'm not interested in, or it may be something that I don't agree with. So the way that I can do that is beat you to the punch and pitch you a story. But I have had people, you know, try to jazz it up and make things sound a bit more declarative or sexy than they are. And so I had to push back on that. It's, and in the layout, they'll have a pull quote that maybe it makes the story seem that it's about one thing that is not because it's sexier or whatever. And so I don't, it's really a challenge and you have to you know, be prepared for that. But uh, something that happened a lot earlier on, like in the vaccine thing that came out was we can get as journalists just continue to go to the same trope without explaining or understanding. And it was about the vaccine hesitancy and why Black people weren't being vaccinated. And it was all around, and they would just say, well, because of Tuskegee, without explaining what happened at Tuskegee and perpetuating the is that just about everybody that I talked to thought that at Tuskegee, Black men were injected with syphilis. And that was, and so when people just referred to that, they kind of perpetuated that myth. And I was like, we have to stop saying that. That is not what happened. And if we don't go to the next level, then we kind of perpetuate this misunderstanding. And also, it wasn't telling the full reason why uh, people of color numbers were lagging so much in, in the vaccination was because of access. Nobody was talking about the access problem. And so I think, you know, that's kind of where I see myself, um, you know, where I can make a difference is to try to do those stories that I sometimes see uh, aren't getting signed or aren't getting the attention. But it can be a challenge because folks don't like you. They like to, I'll get somebody else who's not causing a lot of problems <laughs> you know well i you know it's uh journalists should be a little bit of troublemakers and you you said earlier you know the job is to uh, i think the the famous line is uh, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable and um and you have to have a, i think a a, a a stiff spine to to do that and to to you know pursue what you know to be to be right can i um, there's and, one other go ahead please. i just want to make which is the other reason I push back I, on the one hand it can sound like I'm I was you know being noble or whatever but I wasn't fundamentally it's your name on that right and and if you if you have a body of work that you you don't feel comfortable that has your name on it and, and, and a it ruins you as a journalist moving forward right and b like you might as well go do something else that's right it is your name on it um, that's a great point. So the last, we have a few minutes left and I think um, time for one, one last question. This was asked uh, in a couple of different ways, uh, once by Lorenz and once by Christina. Um, and it kind of gets back to um, an earlier part of this conversation about sort of the metabolism of, of the scientific process versus the journalistic process, which is there are times where you want to be reporting on ongoing scientific uh, research and knowledge, um, but it hasn't sort of concluded yet. And so they're both asking, you know, what are some um, approaches or tips to, you know, 
be able to write about that, show what's true, but also, you know, understanding that the research is incomplete, the 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 um, conclusions are are uh, 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 you know not yet uh, resolved. Uh, one example here is uh, a recent finding of a skull in northeastern China, where paper authors claim it's a new species, but many other experts say it's more likely uh, an example of a, of a of a Denisian species. Um, you know, this is a sort of reporting that I think people are interested in and, and has value and people want to know, but it is hard to say, well, here's the answer. Um, and I'm curious uh, how, what approaches, what tips, what thoughts you all have on, on that? Well, I just want to say quickly, I think this whole year has been a clinic in doing that because we don't know anything about it. We learn something new about the coronavirus every day. So we are constantly reporting on something that is is changing every day and we're learning more about it. I look at where my reporting started a year and a half ago and where it is now. So I just think that's probably when you do some of your best journalism is because you have to stay on top of things and make sure that you um, kind of follow the story and, and stay up to date and let the readers know that this is an ever changing story. Laura Kendra, do you wanna add anything more? It just, oh, oh no, go ahead. You first. Okay, thanks. Yeah, just because this is directly related to what Belda was saying. That, that's exactly right. We, we keep learning new things. And, and so there's like a specific type of headline that we've seen a lot of this year, which is, um, you know, question or new finding about the coronavirus and then what we know so far. So is, is, corona, is the coronavirus airborne? Here's what we know so far. You know, do masks prevent transmission? Here's what we know so far. You know, is it safe to reopen schools? Here's what we know so far. And that's that's sort of like a, a, pr a promise at the very beginning of this, in the headline of the story that, you know, this is constantly changing. We're gonna give you the very latest information. And it's also a promise that that's not all the information. There's more coming and we'll cover that when that comes out too. I was also gonna say that one of the things we've touched on that we haven't really gone down the rabbit hole on is it also depends on the consequence of that story, right? Like getting it wrong on COVID is a problem getting it. I did a story that I looked up today for a random reason on whether or not we're living in a simulation. Getting that wrong has no effect, right? <laughs> like, so like, they're equally like, we don't know, but like one really fundamentally matters if you get it wrong and one kind of doesn't really matter if you get it wrong. And so that's another important thing to keep in mind because it also impacts like how you can tell a story, what headlines you can put in a story, how definitive you can be, how jokey you can be, um, is sort of what is the context and what's a consequence of that story. Very good. And you know, one other thing that comes to my mind is that um, where that story appears is also something we have to take into account. You know, it's one thing if it appears in a newspaper that is most likely going to be, it has a date on it, it's most likely gonna be in the recycling bin tomorrow or even in a magazine that might be on your coffee table for a few months, but eventually it's gonna make its way out versus online where, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, it's it's around forever. Um, and, you know, I just don't, I don't know if anyone wants to sort of touch on how you wanna think about um, sort of online information that way, whether you bear responsibility to go and update old stories or link old stories to new things. Is that something that any of you have thought about or experienced or, or have thoughts on? And I'm just tossing it out there. Well, I'll yeah. tell you why. I'll tell you what, that's a question we'll save for next time because our next webinar is actually all about social media um, and, and the role of social media in terms of sharing science stories, in terms of um, uh, how we can publish, how we can find new author, uh, excuse me, sources and so on and so forth. So uh, I'll leave a cliffhanger. And uh, for those who are here, you can, you can uh, tune in next month. Uh, the, uh, the date for that, is uh, I'm going to tell you what it is in one second. It is August 26th, and you can register for it at ksjhandbook.org. Um, we're at time, so I know there were some questions we didn't get to, but hopefully we got to. I think we got to most of them. I really want to extend my sincere thanks to Laura, to Melba, and Kendra for taking the time and being here today. Um, uh, I think you guys were, were really terrific and, and had a great discussion about this issue. I want to thank all the attendees who came. Um, really appreciate it. I know you're from all over the world at all time zones. Um, so we're really happy that you could join us. 
if uh, um, feel free to, to share the recording of this webinar, which you can find at, I know you've all memorized it, ksjhandbook.org. Um, and, uh, and thanks again to HHMI, Cavley, the Knight Foundation, uh, excuse me, the Knight Science Journalism Fellowship at MIT and SciComm Acts. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. I hope you have a happy and healthy rest of the day, week, month, and uh, we'll hopefully see you again next month. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.